I missed you last week. I'm glad to be back. I was going to be gone because we had this perfectly planned out weekend to watch soccer all weekend long in Temecula for my grandkids. But the rain had other plans. I much rather would have been with you, but I'm here today, and it is Join the Team Day. How many of you are already on the team? Raise your hand. We're going to get every single one of you. You can serve on the team. You're going, why is JJ standing here? It, it's because this is Super Bowl Sunday, and I know some of you don't care. In fact, some of you don't care that you post on your Instagram, I just don't care enough to post that I don't care, right? Or maybe your preparation for the Super Bowl is you start taking your antacids before, you know, the game starts. But I used to be a football official. We don't throw overhand. We throw underhand. And I thought I would have J.J. do a skinny post. All right? So he's going to come over here. I, I, by the way, Mahomes has Kelsey. I mean, Purdy has Ayuk. I got J.J. So he's going to do a skinny post. Here we go. All the way out. Oh! I sent him too long. We're going to do that again. All right. We're going to do a skinny post again. Here we go. Yeah! Thank you, J.J. All right. He's a basketball player, and he usually dunks, right? So I hope you got your outlines ready to go. We are going to look at the final part of this series called Standing Firm. And we're going to look at friends you can count on. This has multiple applications. If you want friends, you ought to be on one of our teams. You will get plugged in. You will find community. You will find your place here at Grace Church. But as we do that, I think about how often men in the church don't have friends. And Paul, on the other hand, talks about two of the most significant friendships in his life. Uh, as we think about that, uh, these kind of friends that you can count on, that you can trust in, trust your life with, uh, the people that have your back, it's a rare commodity. And finding a friend like that is like pure gold. And you may go your entire lifetime sifting through a lot of friendships before you find someone like this. Now, I know that um, with this Super Bowl deal, some of you are a little you know, distracted. The game isn't on till 3.30. You have plenty of time to be here and focused, get your nap in, etc. But I got to tell you, because it's uh, this whole team thing we're doing, do you know one of the things that we are going to kind of provide for you when you leave here? It's one of my favorite things. Do you know what it is? What's my favorite food? Chocolate chip cookies is my favorite dessert, yes. But my favorite food is Mexican food, and on the plaza today, via La Tolteca, we are going to have chips and salsa. I mean, real salsa, all right? And so we're going to join that, but you'll be eating chips and salsa, so you get that pregame uh, salsa thing in. And as we think about the, these friendships things, uh, I was going to give you all these stats about the Super Bowl, but I don't care because I want to get right to the message. So get your notes out here. And we're going to do something a little different. I'm not going to read this whole section because we're going to be covering it, but I've printed out what we're going to be covering today in your notes, and I'm going to actually have you get a pen out because you're going to be circling some things and adding to some things here in just a little bit. So what are the characteristics of a trustworthy friend? We're going to use two examples, and then I'll give you some principles, and you can kind of use that as a checklist, say, do I have that in my life? Let's look at the biographical sketch. Who are these guys that Paul's going to highlight? The first one is Timothy, and he calls him his son, verses 19 to 24. And he says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will generally be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, but but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. He's in prison, remember. I'm not sure how that's going to go. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I, might so, my, I myself will come also. Now, Timothy, his name, you want to fill in the blank, treats him like a son. His name means honor God. He's a native of Lystra and Derby in southern Asia. 
And uh, he's a child of a mixed marriage. By that, I mean his, his Jewish mom, Eunice, and his Greek father, who's never mentioned, which is interesting because he's really heavily influenced by his father's Greek culture, but we don't know much about him because he wasn't circumcised as a child, but later as a young adult. Um, I want to pause here because some of you are single moms in this auditorium, and you're raising kids and you go to church, your spouse doesn't, and it's a tough grow. And I want to identify, not you don't have to raise your hand, but if you're in that category, I want to give you encouragement today because don't think your kids can't come out okay because you're a solo parent. And it works both ways. Some of you are single dads raising kids without a, a spouse helping you with that. And I believe that that's the toughest job in the world. My daughter has five kids. It takes four of us to parent them when we're down in San Diego. So I don't know how you, some of you do that all by yourself. Now, there's an interesting note about Timothy. He had a, par a fairly famous grandma. Her name is Lois, and she had a profound effect on him, according to 1 Timothy 1.5. And so I just want to do a shout out to you grandparents who are coming alongside. I know we're talking about friendships, but it's also a little sidebar on parenting and grandparenting. If you're a grandparent here in the room, would you just kind of raise your hand? You're a grandparent in the room. All right, we got many of you. God bless you. And if you want to be more intentional, this is a shameless plug for a grandparenting seminar. We're going to begin on September, uh, September, February 26th on Monday mornings for six weeks. We'll tell you more about that. So Paul meets and leads Timothy to the Lord on his first missionary journey. If you want to get that, that's in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. But it's in his second missionary journey that he enlists this young Timothy to kind of be his intern, and he begins to mentor and disciple him. So he's talking about Timothy. This is one of the two dear friends he's going to reference, and we'll gather our data from. Paul's this older mentor, and the bottom line is it says in this text that he's going to send him back to Philippi to get some news about how they were doing. And so I want to give you a principle here. There's a commendation to Timothy. Write it down. He says, I have no one else like Timothy who will genuinely care for you. No one besides Timothy who will genuinely care for you. So few of us have that kind of friend in our life. Isn't that true? That that person that you go to the mat. Now, for some of you, it's your spouse. I have a friend, and my spouse, you know, that's my closest friend. Her name is Cheryl. We've been married 45 years. But I have a friend that goes back 55 years. 55 years. By the way, the 55, why is it 55? That's when the church was started here. So that's why we all have 55 today. And it's gray because it goes with my hair. Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so the bottom line is, I have this friend. His name is John Bynum. And we've known each other since junior high. And we are as thick as thieves. And in fact, in doing this message this week, it's kind of coincidental. We hadn't talked in a bit. And I had a time this week to talk to him for two hours. You say, what do you talk about in two hours? Let me tell you, it was more than just about the Super Bowl because he is my dearest, closest friend. And this is what we're talking about. That's the Timothy to, to Paul. Now, the second guy is Epaphroditus, and you can write in the word brother, and you'll see verses 25 to 30. For I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. You're going to circle those three words. We're going to come back to them, all right? Circle brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier on your notes. And your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you, all that uh, for you all, and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy. There's that word joy again. And honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, we don't know much about Epaphroditus. We know that some think he might have been the pastor of the Philippian church. Um, Paul kind of writes about him here, but he's a behind-the-scenes guy that we really don't have much biographical information on. Um, in some ways, he's a, a kingdom nobody. 
And that seems harsh, but so many of you in this room, I think sometimes feel like you're a kingdom nobody. Nobody knows your name. You come in, you go out. But I know that God can use every single person in this room. And that's why we want you to join this team. And so he's behind the scenes guy, but he did something that's interesting. He doesn't just want to contribute to the offering. He's volunteering to carry that offering and transport the offering to Paul in Rome. So he's sent to deliver this financial gift to Paul while he's in jail under house arrest. And he's uh, entrusted with this large amount of money. Now, this is a trusted guy. Because you're going to give him a lot of cash and like hope he doesn't skip town and go to the Caymans, right? Right? I, I'm remembering a time when I had a lot of money in my possession. I was 16 years old. It was Christmas Eve night. It was at the Robinson's May uh, department store in West Covina. And I was closing out the liquor and gourmet department. I had nothing, to, I knew nothing about alcohol and I sold a lot of cheese packs that Christmas. And so I had six or eight thousand dollars mostly in cash. I don't know why we where's all the credit card receipts? I had all that, but I had at least six or eight thousand dollars in cash. The lights are dimmed in the store. I have to go to this unmarked room up an escalator that was not going anymore. And for a brief moment in time, true confession, I'm thinking, eight thousand dollars is a lot of money. But I really don't want to go to jail. I'm going to go right to that door and lap it up. But some of you have maybe been in that situation. You're entrusted with something. And you're not going to do anything to mess that up. You want to deliver the goods. And so that's Epaphroditus who delivers the goods. The problem is shortly after he gets there, he gets really sick. He's, he's ill. He almost dies. And so after he recovered, uh, Tim Paul had planned to send him back. But he's going to send Timothy back to Philippi with this letter. And so Paul emphasizes that what Epaphroditus did in contrast to who Timothy was. Epaphroditus, what he did in contrast to Timothy, who he was. So here's the command if you want to write it down. Hold him in highest honor or esteem. All right? So those are the two guys. And from this text, we're going to go through this again. That's the overview of our two guys, one a son, one a brother, and hopefully you will find that. I want to give you some principles on the backside of your phrase. What are the basis of biblical friendships based on these two guys? The poet John Donne said, no man is an island. And even though Paul is fiercely independent, um, he needed friends. Just for a moment, do you think Paul, this is just a sidebar that just kind of, maybe this is a little off, but do you think Paul was maybe a bit high maintenance as a friend? When you read about him, do you think he was easy to be friends with? I don't think so. This guy is a hard-charging, driven guy. Next week, we're going to look at his resume. I think if you were his friend, you worked a lot harder at that friendship than he did. Now, I can't prove that, but we'll get to heaven. We'll say, hey, Paul, were you high maintenance or not? But I think these guys loved him for who he was, just the way he was. By the way, we know he can get into it with people. He gets into it with the most famous encourager on the planet. What was that guy's name? Remember him? Barnabas, the son of encouragement. They kind of broke up, and that's why they went on separate missionary journeys later on. And Barnabas, Paul gets Silas, and Barnabas goes his way. And so I just want to make sure you understand that when you have biblical friendships, it doesn't mean that they come easy. A good friendship is a give and take. It's up and down. It's all around. And at times, you have to work hard to maintain those friendships. So I'm looking at all of you out here, and some of you never text anybody else. You never make the phone call. You don't make the text. And you are always on the receiving end of that. Now, some of us who are always making those texts, who are always making those phone calls, we're a little tired is your arm broken? I have an excuse. Mine is broken, right? You know, I'm not shoulder, uh, shoulder thing here. And so I want to encourage you. It's a two-way street, friends. As we look at these characteristics, let's equally move towards each other as we're developing these friendships. All right. Enough ranting. I'm back to the text. Here we go. First characteristic is they were like-minded. 
It says, no one was like him, a kindred spirit. It's only used two times, and it literally means same sold. So when you have a, a biblical friend, an authentic friend, a real friend, a long-lasting friend, you're probably like-minded. Um, I think I've used this illustration before, but ladies, mostly ladies, have watched this. Anybody watch Anne of Green Gables? Have you, have you seen that? Uh, like four of you, five of you. Um, Anne and Diana, that, they were kindred spirits, right? Um, I think uh, Clayton Kershaw and uh, Barnes are kindred spirits, pitchers and catchers, etc. And so they thought alike, they were congruent, even though their temperaments were very different. Who would have been like-minded in the Old Testament? Give me the famous friendship duo uh, in the Old Testament. Between who and who? David and Jonathan. Now, you got the idea. So who is your David or who is your Jonathan? Who is your Timothy? Secondly, they were compassion-driven. Verses 20 and 21, they were genuinely concerned. Now, I'm going to generalize here, but guys, we talk about sports, cars, jobs, finances, you know, gardening. Well, not so much gardening. I hate gardening. But, you know, we talk about all kinds of stuff. But do we really get beneath the surface to talk about things that really make a difference in our lives? And so he was generally interested in their welfare and how they were doing. He's talking about Timothy caring about the Philippian church. So God is looking for men and women who show compassion to other people, that put people before power, projects, profits, possessions, and pleasure, who put people, get this, before projects, profits, power, possessions, and pleasure. They care about the right things. We care about the things that are truly important. Good Samaritan had the right priorities. Jesus wept for the city of Jerusalem. Are we people of compassion? Now, compassion sometimes gets confused with sentimentalism. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about a deep-seated, in-your-soul compassion for other people. Now, it's pretty um, awesome that God created me as an extrovert, and I'm also a pastor. Those things are not always synonymous. Not every pastor will be extroverted. Some are introverted. In fact, your next pastor may be more introvert than extrovert. You know, you're going to have to give him time. I happen to be an extrovert, so everyone in this room is just uh, a stranger, is, is just a friend I haven't met yet, right? Right? And so that allows me to go uh, an inch deep and a while, mile wide with a lot of people. But I'm talking about compassion that goes deep. I mean, deep. And that takes time because you can't just do that in a three-minute conversation. And some of you, that is an effort. I was sitting with a dear family this week as we planned their mom's memorial service, which I'll be doing tomorrow. And I thought I had perfectly had it under control. I could just talk, and we'd kind of talk things through. And I found myself getting choked up just, just ever so quickly. And I tried to cover it up, and uh, I didn't do a very good job of that. I generally want you to know that I care for you. And even if I don't know you yet, I want you to know that God loves you, that there is a purpose in your life. And this idea of compassion, we need to show it more and more one another. Amen? By the way, when you're on a team, you get cared for. I am going to be relentlessly redundant to get you, get the team theme out today, right? When you're on a team, you often get cared for, and there is compassion. Thirdly, if you have a biblical friendship, it's going to be Christ-centered, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So it's a kind of a negative illustration if you're going to have a genuine friend, you, who is that Christ-centered friend? Not your golf buddy, not your pickleball partner, not your financial advisor. Who is that Christ-centered friend who's not self-absorbed or not self-centered? And so he's kind of uh, reinforcing what he's already said in Philippians chapter 2 earlier in verses 3 and 4. Um, 
Timothy served Paul. He was the number two. Most of my ministry career, I've been the number two. Haven't been the number one. I've been in the number two role a lot. And one of my goals is to make every pastor I ever work with successful in what they did so he could have a ministry that would last for a very long time. So I was talking with the search committee this week. Um, you know, this is my third interim pastor. My first one I did in my 40s, my hair was less gray. It was salt and pepper back then, right? And that pastor that came in during my time there has now been there 20 plus years at the Cypress Free Church. My second um, interim was a few years ago, now over 12 where I was the interim, and that pastor, Scott Kegel, has now been on that staff for 12 years. And uh, one of my closest friends, I was the interim, I did the search, I found him, and then he hired me, which never happens. So, I am telling you right now, I believe that your next pastor could have a very long, uh, I don't want to say runway, I I want him to get in the air quick, (laughs) but a long tenure here, because I believe that you have something going that is very important. You have a great staff, a great team, and you're a healthy church. And those things, you can have a good team in an unhealthy church, or a, uh, but generally good teams produce healthy churches. And so you have that, and you should be grateful for it. Christ-centered. And so that's what uh, defines this relationship, Christ-centered. H, uh, F. B. Meyer preached into his 80s, and when he was at the age of 82, he said in one of his sermons, I have only one ambition, to be God's errand boy. Are you God's errand boy in the sense that Christ is your focus and you'll do and orient your life so that's reflected? Now, I want to show you a picture of an iceberg. I think that's coming up here. I want to show you this. So when we talk about being on a team and ministering and friendships, this part, and that looks like a huge iceberg. That's only 10% of that iceberg. 90% of what you see is, you can't see it. It's underneath the surface. And so when you have biblical friendships, what people see on the outside is just a little bit of who you are. But what really sustains biblical friendships is what's underneath the surface of your life. That's where your true character is. It's, It's who you are when nobody is watching you. And so, it's your integrity, it's your honesty, it's your Christ-centeredness. And so, our character is ultimately the foundation upon which we live as Christ followers. We have to be Christ-centered. It should influence your decision-making. I'm I'm, I'm so glad you're, you're in church today. There's no need to be watching nine hours of pre super Bowl warm-ups and analysis, you know? Here's the, here, I'll give you one. What's the over or under how many times CBS is going to cut to Taylor Swift in the booth with Brittany Mahomes and mom-in-law or whatever? There's like odds on whether, you know, Kelsey's going to propose at the end of the game. Oh, my goodness gracious. You know what? I'm, here's another one. 1.45 billion wings are going to be eaten worldwide today. CBS hopes to have 115 million people watch the game. And I'm, I'm rattling off these statistics like I care. I don't. But I'd get up at 5.30 this morning to find a few of them. Because what's really important is what I'm talking about. you got to find a friend. You have to have a friend. If you're a lone ranger here today, let me encourage you. That's not the way to live the Christian life. Fourth principle is they were servant-oriented. Good friends are servant-oriented. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Here's a sad factoid. In any given church in America, it's about a two-to-one ratio between women versus men serving in the church. So I particularly am calling men to serve in this church. And there's so many. We're going to go out in the plaza. There's so many places you can plug in. So many different places you can plug in. So don't just sit on the sideline. James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead. So here's what servants are like. It's sacrifice over self-indulgence. 
It's service over security. And we kind of contrast that with those who are kind of power hungry and always want the limelight and the attention. You know what makes my wife awesome? And she's not even here to hear this wonderful little tribute. She is such a loving hostess. We have a college kid in a room in one bedroom. We got another couple from South Carolina living with us. She has this egg dish she got up at Old Dark Thirty to make for everybody this morning. She is a servant. I'm the recipient of her servant lifestyle. She's taught me so much about what it means to live in such a way that you please God, but nobody knows what you're doing behind the scenes. She's servant-oriented. Last or Next is proven dependability, verses 22 to 24. But you know Timothy's proven worth. What does that mean? He proved to be consistent and reliable. Remember, he's young when Paul first meets him, not unlike John Mark, who was also young, who had a little run-in with Paul early on in his ministry. And so, he was dependable. His integrity demanded it. His convictions were such that he was not overcome by his compulsions. He was tested. The Chicago Tribune had a definition contest for the best definition of a friend years ago. They said this is the definition that won. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world goes out. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world goes out. That is that person. You know who was one of my best friends growing up, and I never told him enough how much I valued his friendship, and you're going to think, this is different. My dad. My dad. He was the one that I could count on. By the way, my mom I could too, but my dad was the one who never missed a, a baseball game in all the years I played baseball. He was someone I could, he was proven, he was dependable. Cheryl and I were talking about how in ministry you move a lot. I started off, my first church was in West Covina where I grew up, and I served for 10 years in Huntington Beach. Then God exiled me to the land of the frozen chosen in Minnesota. I just say that kiddingly, but 14 years. Then I spent uh, six years in Yorba Linda, four years in Moor Park, and then I've been at a Girl Bible Fellowship for the pre previous 12 years. And then this is the postscript for me being here with you. All those moves, all those changes, you find out very quickly who and what church can you depend on. Who are the go-to people that are dependable? And you know what, Grace Church? You have those kind of people in spades here. It's an awesome, awesome place to find people who are dependable. They're right here. Next, number six, they were relationally connected. I said, I asked you to circle the words brother, fellow worker, and soldier. I know that's on the other side, but I want to highlight that. He's now going to switch from Timothy and describe friendship in relationship to Epaphroditus. So he, he describes Epaphroditus in three ways. First of all, he's brother. He's brother to them. In other words, they are family. That word brother is used 133 times. And when I ask, think about brother, and we look at verse 25, the question is, who is in your heart? Let's go to that slide. Secondly, fellow worker. We are focused. There's a common goal. The common goal is that who is by your side. So who is in your heart? Who is by your side? We're family. We're focused. And then he says, fellow soldier. Make no mistake, friends. If you're going to get in this game, it's a fight. It's a fight. It's a battle. It's going to cost you something to be on this team. Who has your back? So look at those here. As you look at your own relationships. Do you have brothers and sisters where your family, they're part of your heart? Are you, do you have a team you're on where you see that fellow workers, you're, you're focused, who's by your side? And who are the fellow soldiers? We're in a fight. Who's got your back?
Lastly, he was courageously committed. These kind of friends are courageously committed to you. He instructs them to hold the guys like Epaphroditus up because, quite frankly, Epaphroditus is the one who's willing to risk his life for the gospel. Now, I have never really had to risk my life for the gospel. The first time I saw the stakes were pretty high was back in 1989 when I took a team of high school and college students to Lima, Peru, and we're in the Callao district. It's kind of the the beach district of Peru, and everywhere there were 16-year-old kids with M16s and guns, and the shining path was very prevalent, and they were in the habit of kidnapping missionaries and Americans at the time. Looking back on it, what in the world were we thinking taking kids to Lima, Peru in 1989? But God's hand of protection were on us. Fast forward, it's early 90s. I'm on an underground team in China meeting with leaders of the underground church, lecturing in universities, English as a second language. But at night, I'm meeting with the underground church. I thought back to that, I go, that was crazy. That's what caused my hair to go gray, I'm pretty sure. And so, but I've really never had to face down a gun or be persecuted for my faith. I've never been thrown in jail. But there have been Christian brothers and sisters all over the world, and if you've never read Fox's Book of Martyrs, or if you've never looked at the Worldwide Sunday for the Persecuted Church, you should, because it's a real thing. You see, Epaphroditus was going to travel 800 uh, he traveled 800 miles. It was a six-week travel over rough terrain. And he got that disease. He got infection, dysentery, we don't know, but he nearly dies. But he didn't quit. Mark 8, 35, whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. Whoever loses life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. Such courage. And it's interesting, Epaphroditus, I want to give you a little sidebar Greek lesson here. Aphrodite a.k.a. Venus, was the goddess of gamblers. So when a pagan Greek threw the dice, he would cry out, Epaphroditos, meaning favorite of Aphrodite. So Epaphroditus' name may have connections to this custom. In fact, it may have been written that Epaphroditus literally risked or gambled his life as a play on his friend's name. He literally put his life on the line. Henry Martin, an uh, Anglican missionary and linguistic expert, on his eve of his departure to India said, I go to burn out for God. I am prepared to go anywhere. I'm ready to help anyone. I'm prepared to sacrifice anything. And he died shortly before his 31st birthday. So Epaphroditus was courageous and he was committed. This idea of risk. Don't play it safe, friends. Step out of your comfort zone. Do something that you're not comfortable with and try it. So proud of my, my new, my new daughter-in-law. My son got married last May. She says to John Daniel, my son, she goes, we got to serve. We can't just come and sit here. She's a relatively new Christian and we got to serve. So you know what she's serving? She's serving in children's ministry with special needs kids. She's assigned to the same kid every week. She's been bitten, she's been spit on, she's been hit. And she comes back every week. And that family she serves, she's serving the Lord. But don't you know it, that that family loves Sydney. She's risking it. She wasn't sure about it. My son, like, couldn't be left out. They're like, okay, I got to serve. He's doing a little safer serving. He's an usher, right? And he has big guys all around him, so if something really gets really, out they go. Nah, none of that. Where are you serving? History tells us that the most spiritual revivals have started when men get serious about their faith. 
Ladies, I'm not letting you off the hook, but I'm certainly putting the men on the hook. And I'm not here to make you feel bad because on Father's Day, well, you know, you, you get, you're once a year out of boy. But today, men and women, we need you to serve. And it's going to require sacrifice. See this picture up here? I think I have a picture of a pig and a hen. You know the story. The orphanage needs some food donations. They're talking to one another. The chicken says, well, we should make a donation. You and I both. The big pig goes, ah, not so quick. You lay an egg, that's a donation. If I provide the bacon, it's sacrifice. <laughs> we don't need eggs today. We want sacrifice. We need both. And so where will you fit in the team? As a friend, are you ready to step up? Go anywhere, any place, ready to help anytime? What kind of Christian, what kind of servant, what kind of church member do you want to be? I believe that this message on friends is really a dual message because you get all that. You do this, you serve on our team here, you're going to find those kinds of qualities. and You'll get to serve with some of the greatest people I know, and they're sitting all around you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's worship together.